Hi, good evening all. This is Vishal Singhal from Southside, your host for today. So we are hosting uh, Mr. Joe Pereira from Streamin uh, US. He's the CEO for the company. He is inventor on 80 patents, which is very commendable. And I would say first of its kind uh, uh, guest speaker that we are having. Uh, so he's an entrepreneur and innovator who led developments in recommendation and content understanding using NLP computer vision. Previously, he developed telecom systems in India, internet uh, networking, network routing systems, and large scale content recognition systems. So uh, he is uh, going to talk about from, from video understanding to applications. I am handing over the uh, controls to Joe. Joe, please go ahead. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vishal. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to share uh, my understanding um, of how to take AI and build applications. Um, and we have been focusing mostly on uh, video understanding, but essentially uh, this includes almost uh, you know, all the elements of AI to understand video at a high level and to drive uh, applications. Um, uh, I'm sure you, you're aware of uh, Geoffrey Hinton, who's called the father of uh, modern AI. Uh, you know, from 2006 at uh, Waterloo University, he's been making uh, innovations uh, when you know, at one point AI was pretty much trended. So his uh, vision is, you know, and, and it's, it's actually very true, as you see, um, we need to map all these uh, solutions to uh, how are the human brain works as well as to natural elements, you know, how things function in a natural way. Uh, you know, systems are much more complicated, but if you can understand how they operate in a natural way, you, you will be able to generate very uh, good solutions. So let me go to my first slide. Oops. Okay. Yep. Oh. Um, Shall I'm not able to <laughs> move to the next slide. Let's see. Uh, okay, how do do that? Why is that? Okay. Yeah. You can try going back to normal mode. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay, so uh, this slide will talk about uh, the AI services that you can provide using um, video and content. Uh, you know, after you understand video and content, you, uh, you know we have camera feeds. Um, for surveillance uh, you know, almost in every government facility for public infrastructure as well as home security um, and it, it's, it's a very big application the other big application is being able to organize uh, the variety of media content for viewers right um, you know we do feel uh, you know overloaded by just the sheer uh, amount of data that comes in many of it is fake Many of it is pushed by marketers, uh, or you know, or people who want to just get uh, media attention. So you really need an application that will organize, um, especially educational content or any uh, specific content that is very uh, organized better for viewers. Again, the same thing applies for smarter news. Being able to you know just skip fake news and clickbait, uh, you know the uh, or typically waste our time. And all this requires, you know, organizing the facts in such a way that uh, you are able to process uh, most important information and also the relationship between concepts over time, uh, value of the concept, you know. Similarly, be able to organize media and content for healthcare and other industries. Uh, healthcare is going to be a major growth area for AI, and it's uh, 
again going to be involving not just video and content but it's actually being able to understand all research content all uh, medical reports and such the easiest market you know for um, startups like us is again uh, advertising and media uh, because they move fast and uh, the bars are lower uh, so uh, that's a good application for startups to start so uh, just a overview again about ai models uh, ai models have become very popular because they provide very good accuracy but uh, that's not enough uh, you know there are few drawbacks the number of items recognized is small the accuracy drops as soon as the items uh, are increased and and also it does not recognize typically any new objects right it will recognize the only stuff that is in the uh, in the model or the model has been trained for uh, plus they are not amenable to the edge uh, of course there's a lot of work going on but uh, you need there is a lot of effort to push that at the edge so again i just put a quote from professor daphne kohler is uh, ai the universal architecture so maybe not as of now because you know there are many interacting modules that need to work and you'll see as we talk further uh, this slide talks about our vision for streaming. Essentially, uh, there are four elements. The input side uh, that analyzes uh, inputs, video inputs from the edge, processes in the cloud, uh, you know, the heavy neural net processes, um, do audio and video and text analysis, uh, both at the edge as well as cloud, we need to do at the edge so that we can be fast uh, and not necessarily burden um, the cloud with analyzing every uh, single detail. Um, the data lake is the uh, is, um, is the is the result um, holds almost all the data generated by our various sources. So that's a very critical platform for any application. And today, um, you know, there is a concept called data lake, and there's a concept of um, managing the data efficiently. And there are platforms uh, that can talk to other sources, other models, other processors. Uh, so that is uh, very important. Uh, the data lake, again, uh, talks to processors against uh, streaming, is a very key so that's uh, you can see the that is a mod that is a data catalogs called events right these are all the events that come in and go uh, and then they are generated real time so and many are processed in real time so that streaming processing is very critical as well uh, at the top uh, you have natural language processing and knowledge graphs so these are very important to keep all the concepts the relationships uh, between all the inputs that you have, all the models that are generated, all the events that come in, right? And uh, th this is a very important element. And on the right side, you have data processing and machine learning models. Again, these are generated from user data and, uh, and all the elements that come in are processed through the data pipelines. And at the bottom, you have applications. The applications really provide you the service. So, you know, uh, this, uh, I've just highlighted one application, which is recommendations. So you, the user will get recommendations um, based on the user interaction. And all the data that comes in, you know, is very critical to make very good recommendations. For example, if there are some new events that come in and new shows that are produced, that are very relevant to what the user wants, or, or if there are shows that uh, you know, is are suddenly becoming very popular, uh, some new event has occurred, so um, you will like to push those to the 
user. So you can see that all this together is a very key component to drive um, a complete application. Okay. Uh, this next slide is uh, essentially the same, uh, but just more detail into it. Um, you know, it looks, looks more busy. Uh, it has uh, like various uh, services that are more applications, uh, but it's essentially the same, but with just more color, uh, uh, more um, variety of inputs, you know, the tools are labeled, so you can get a feel of uh, what constitutes uh, this kind of a platform. Uh, okay, so I think now we are, um, Ready for a small poll. Um, this is essentially uh, to. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Audience, please respond to this poll. more to go please respond to the poll another 10 seconds please respond to the poll audience there's no more responses coming i'll close close it so this is the result Okay. All right, very good. All right. So, uh, yeah, are you able to see my screen? No, no. Uh, yes. Okay. All right, so it's uh, it's uh, very heartening to see that the coverage of video processing, I think uh, NVIDIA and Intel have been making lots of, um, lots of uh, push into this market. So it looks like it has got the attention. Uh, you know, there's edge processing also in the speakers. I think there was uh, people who are just put, there was a 0% for speakers, you know, all the, um, uh, speakers, the Alexas, the Google speakers, uh, even uh, Siri on your phone, right? Uh, or uh, other, or even uh, even on your uh, TV, right? You're speaking on the TV. There's lots of these um, speakers uh, side speaker as well as the speech recognition. Uh, lots of elements have been pushed to the edge. Not necessarily the entire models, but uh, some stages of the models have been pushed to the edge for, spe for speakers and uh, speech, voice speech. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot more happening, but uh, I, I just wanted to just highlight the uh, voice-based interfaces. Actually, voice-based interfaces could become very more prominent uh, even to let you control some of your devices uh, at, at home and because they are, you know, they, they are much more easier. They don't need a screen. They are typically low cost. So there's a good chance that a lot of interfaces would be just speech, okay, on the edge side. Uh, do we have to talk about anything here? Uh, we will talk more about information retrieval and Neural net interactions. Uh, uh, so uh, this uh, is an example of the data lake and showing all the data pipelines that are generating information into the data lake. Right, so this, this uh, is an example for recommendations. 
Uh, for example, the video features are generated from the edge of video feeds. The metadata of every object, you know, logos, text, um, actions inside that video, uh, what they mean, uh, you know, the entire set of uh, data is also kept in the lake, data lake. There is additional information about shows, about locations, you know, about every item. Like even if it's a truck, you could have a variety of information. And uh, since this is a recommendation, this is mostly for uh, shows. But in a sense, uh, all, all uh, relevant metadata and information would be stored in the data lake for your application. For uh, recommendations, the VR information is necessary. The history, the sessions, you know, we interacted with Netflix or any of the uh, better recommendation services, you would see that they have almost all the information about your viewership. So that's very critical. The content sources, you should know all the content sources that are available so that you can recommend correctly to the user. Um, and on the top, on the right side, you have the user profiles. The user profiles is what the user likes to watch, uh, user uh, at different times, different moods. Um, there are uh, user profiles that are also real time based on user interaction. Uh, that's not uh, that level of depth is not shown here, but essentially um, there is an interactive model as well, which just responds to how you're interacting uh, in the immediate short term. The uh, content models, uh, which are showing you know the relationship between different shows. Um, on the left side, with the metadata was present. They would also have metadata about how recent is this show? Uh, you know, where variety of uh, relationship is this coming live? You know, uh, all those things so that it helps make a better decision. So this information is like very important to make better recommendations. If you can see, uh, it's not just a collaborative filter model. You know, that is used to generate the user profiles. There's a lot more that goes on. Um, there is entity and rela NLP relationships that is extracted. Slate recommendation models, these are typically uh, work with interactive user behavior. So uh, essentially this is what's happening on the real time. The rest of the models are typically offline. Uh, machine learning models, again, yeah, these are need to be generated. What's the community relationships? Uh, what are anomalies? And finally reporting uh, and aggregations. Um, so these are some of the typical pipe data pipeline operation that need to be done um, and stored and easily accessible in a data lake. So you can see how important this, uh, this data platform and data lakes become. Uh, even the revision control is becomes critical. Uh, management of data lake becomes very critical as well. Um, next slide. This is uh, uh, more about the the processes that need to run to deliver a recommendations uh, application. So on the left side, we saw all the um, data sets that are generated in the data lake, right? Uh, which we saw in the pipeline generated those um, data sets and you see they are all populated here on the left side in the blue boxes. And on the right side, these are the processes that are actually run to, to deliver the service to the user, right? So you're getting in the interactive data from the apps. You're actually delivering the recommendation from the slates. You are uh, getting new information about uh, new videos or new TV shows, uh, right? As well as, and you're constantly um, updating the models for the users as and when required. Right, so a cold, um, what is a cold model, right? Um, cold start, starting from cold start means when the user has very little information. Uh, so you have to associate a model for a user or a content uh, which has very little um, information about it, at least uh, in the way people, how people interact with it. 
Okay, um, did I go back? Okay. So uh, we went through um, um, the the um, data lake, data platform side. Uh, now we will briefly look at um, how content recognition is uh, performed. So let's say, how are we going to uh, find um, if similar um, image or similar object appears with information retrieval? Uh, this is a process with information retrieval, not neural networks. Um, and the reason we talk about this is because uh, this um, approaches allow you to scale to millions and billions of items and much more efficiently than neural nets. So um, I just uh, listed uh, Gary Bradsky. Uh, he was a pioneer of OpenCV, still is. Um, he's, uh, he, he often puts out new uh, ventures in robotics AI, um, open robotics software, Uh, again, so the previous slide was about um, how video features are generated. Let, let me just talk a little more about those. So if you see um, the car, right, that on the left side, it is represented. Um, it is represented by, uh, you know, see on the, the lines in the, uh, on the right side. So each group, each region, so if you see, uh, there are different groups of images. So each one is a region that is detected and it is described by those uh, gradients, the lines. Sometimes it looks like a star, sometimes it looks like a, uh, a couple of lines uh, crossing each other, right? So those are the uh, gradients. And essentially you would describe them in some uh, with a vector or a bit vector for efficiency. So these uh, values that you see um, would be represented as a feature vector. And this is how you would be able to uh, recover that uh, um, a query that this image is actually looks like that car on the left. Uh, a similar approach for audio, but uh, of course the processing is slightly different. Um, and uh, typically you would do a couple of things. You would get audio features, you could get uh, classifications, and you could uh, also segment it. Segmentation is very critical for many, many applications. It essentially partitions uh, you know, different speakers. Say if you're uh, trying to recognize some uh, speech, or even a command, which is, which is very important on the edge, right? Uh, all the interfaces that will be built into the systems. So segmentation is very key to separate out, uh, you know, different speakers um, when someone starts and ends. Um, so this slide here, hence, uh, you know, describes uh, uh, how features are extracted and at more advanced information is extracted from the audio signal. Um, you know, at this point, it is ready for you know advanced uh, work. You could do speech recognition at the next level. You could do content recognition. Uh, you could do multiple uh, things at the next level from here. Um, the next, this slide is uh, talks about video analysis offered by all the big companies. Microsoft offers it, Google offers it. Same thing with Amazon recognition. So they are typically um, very similar. They have, a, um, they off, they have uh, individual modules and they have, uh, uh, sometimes they put this in this pipeline, they show, uh, essentially you have a pretty limited uh, set of options. When you go, it, you have to kind of uh, be uh, work into their defined structure. And uh, to really get value, uh, larger value out of this, you need to actually change almost everything. Say, for example, you have this named entities and this NLP extraction, right? You um, 
if you want to extract from the OCR the optical character recognition, which comes from the video, you would need to do a lot more um, processing beyond what is offered here. Uh, it's not very complicated, but you really want to dig in to get better value of uh, what's out there. And also there are some practical things that are not, um, not actually supported easily here. For example, I will give you an example uh, with speech recognition, right? Speech recognition is always limited by the dictionary size. And uh, any word that comes from outside is called considered out of vocabulary, OOV. And typically, uh, it would not recognize those values. So even today's uh, speech recognition systems, if you are aware of, you know, if you're interacting with Siri or you interact with uh, any of the popular Alexas, you will see that uh, foreign sounding names are not recognized because they are not in that vocabulary. And a simple uh, uh, workaround for that is to be provide a, a small vocabulary when this translation is done. Uh, that is a workaround which is uh, very popular um, and it is a must. So in any of these cases, so vocabulary has to be contributed and you cannot provide this vocabulary unless you know what's in the image. So typically there would be an iterative approach. You would know what this whole um, topic is the subject is, you would know that from the OCR typically, OCR typically has a lot more information, but whatever you would have from a context and you would have to provide that as a input to these speech recognition. And, and, and all, all these uh, very critical details are not supported automatically. I mean, and, and I'm just giving you a feel of this, uh, but essentially this is the way things work. And that's why I'm showing you this slide. Uh, these are the critical elements um, that are required to analyze the uh, videos. Uh, but uh, to really get value out of it, you have to dig deeper, you have to build your own uh, improvements. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Okay, so this actually uh, nicely pulls into my uh, my next slide that you know these systems are very good but you know this is very uh, you know we need engineers to add value this is where you come in you know it's the proper problems are not solved <laughs> and that's why uh, we are required to build value to the systems so i have a poll here uh, vishal Audience waiting for your response, please. Yeah. Still more to go, please all of you respond. Others remaining, please respond. Another 10 seconds. Great, thank you. So I'm closing the poll and showing the results. All right. Great, oh, nice. uh, closing now. Thanks. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed with the answer. <laughs> so um, um, the way the pricing works today is I think it will cost you at least half a dollar. And so many of the features are not covered. Uh, so let me see uh, my slide again disappeared. We are closely following Biden's and <laughs> came towards from that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a very, very interesting race. Anyway, <laughs> um, the the numbers were, I think, were pretty impressed. Point one or less. Ideally, you want the cost to be below even point one set for a video um, per minute. 
uh, else you know it just becomes too costly for example if you have 10 cameras at home and they are active you know for uh, 10 hours a day it's uh, it's uh, uh, it, you know that's 14000 minutes in a day right so it will be um, it, it um, sorry no no it's my it's 600 minutes in a day so even if it's 0.1 it's 60 dollar a day it's quite a lot um and typically in a business side the cameras are active almost uh, continually right and in that case they would be even 10x uh, or more costly so even 0.1 cent is very expensive but the typical uh, systems from amazon cost like i think at least half a dollar to one dollar and they still have uh, many limitations so i'm just listing them down here uh, they do not have content recognition uh, you know you, you just saw that uh, microsoft box uh, you know you are forced to work within that box they do not have ability to detect unknown objects the nlp modules have uh, are typically older or you know they have been built uh, previously and they do not integrate your entities nicely uh, you know additional concepts or additional um, uh, improvements that you need to do um, they do not integrate that well you may have to literally build it yourself um, you do not have the ability to easily call advanced modules as required and and you cannot it's, you literally have to build an efficient pipeline by yourself uh, otherwise you are paying uh, you know very expensive pricing it's good for uh, you know small sizes of content right you have limited contents poc proof of value concept but for the real life you know really the cost has to come down and that's why you know we the engineers are going to make that difference uh, edge processing is a differentiator uh, that's one of my sides and here i have like four edge devices right we had this discussion uh, what are edge processing uh, you know that is um, edge processing on the clouds uh, on the in the cars to, as well you know cars uh, of course uh, i think many people don't have teslas but uh, um, most of the european cars already have um, even uh, cars now maybe in india as well um, 2020 was a standard in europe to um, make cars intelligent so that people can drive in the same lane detect um, ob um, obstacles so they don't hit people um, so intelligent vehicles have been there um, autom um, what tesla claims as uh, fully automatic driving is actually um, actually more of a marketing slogan uh, you know i think uh, elon musk said the car will drive 99 percent of the time uh, automatically yeah <laughs> so the remaining one percent yeah you, you have to take that risk so and the uh, other edge devices here are the speakers here and then um, on the left side you have the phones uh, tvs uh, you know you, you can literally um, if you have a good application you could put it in any place including your door uh, you know the doorbell video uh, ring doorbell came up uh, and then somebody said it's cameras i guess uh, that's the same application uh, but it could also go into you know every uh, device you are at home your uh, your refrigerator um, dishwasher you know could be even lights don't need that intelligence but uh, it could be um, other uh, other critical devices uh, might have that uh, but the the speech interface could be uh, interface for many many uh, of your interactions and not necessarily through the phone um, okay so again i think i'm just highlighting some of the um, re relevant um, quotes here miss bakshi she's talked about smart low power sensors yes it will be very critical and robotics is basically being able to see and then communicating between machines so you know it could be you know you could build surveillance you could build uh, protection um, 
safety mechanisms, um, variety of things uh, using um, edge processing and AI. Lacoon, who was the inventor of MNIST, so this was one of the biggest um, work that came out before 2006, um, before you know Geoffrey Hinton made big advancements. Um, before that, and uh, the MNIST is basically uh, recognizing digits, letters. Um, that was um, much done much earlier, and this was the technology used to read uh, your checks, uh, addresses, mailing addresses. So he did say, if intelligence is a cake, right, the bulk of the cake is unsupervised learning, and your um, the supervised learning is uh, only the icing and reinforcement learning is the cherry on the cake so this nicely summarizes uh, the the world of uh, um, um, you know machine learning uh, okay now um, i'll briefly touch on recognition right we talked about neural nets and this is uh, uh, we got to address uh, recognition so uh, what's the difference between recognition uh, versus uh, with information retrieval versus neural nets? So essentially, uh, it's able to recognize across millions of categories and billions, right? How are they generated? We looked at the uh, feature generation for images and we saw the feature generation for audio, right? We brief briefly touched those. So essentially, those are used to create uh, embedded vectors. Uh, which represent uh, audio or video and uh, there is a science of information retrieval um, it goes deeper than just the text search if you are familiar with google text search right google or you know there are modern uh, uh, text search which is basically inverted indexes uh, this goes a little more deeper than that um, and it's basically the same science of information retrieval um, uh, to detect more complex content, which you know, if you have a feature vector that is a multi-dimensional vector, you need something more sophisticated. And you know, recently, uh, if you have followed uh, NMS Lib and FAS, F-A-I-S-S, which is FAS is a Facebook uh, solution, and um, nicely, Facebook has made many of these things open source. Now they they are producing very good open source in AI. Uh, FAST is a solution which they use to demonstrate that they could search across 1 billion face images. Uh, just imagine that 1 billion faces could be recognized through this system. And this is, uh, you know, you know, uh, four, uh, six scales more than, uh, you know, you know, a million times more than what your typical neural nets do, right? You can classify it only into thousand, say, and with major effort, maybe 10,000, but you're losing accuracy already. So uh, there is um, very interesting work in these areas, um, and it's a very important concept for companies. All the, I think all the big companies are looking at this as a very critical element to handle uh, more, uh, more types of uh, items uh, again just want to highlight downsides of uh, another slide on this of neural nets uh, neural nets requires millions of parameters and operations uh, compared to um, the information retrieval which works much more efficiently um, um, again this is a little bit of a discussion about neural nets uh, neural nets are by far the best solution uh, you know to generate features um, that are used for statistics and information retrieval they are by far the best method but to provide all the answers it's not sufficient so uh, neural nets efficiencies have been um, basically improved from a variety of um, advances you know compute and storage capacity algorithms uh, you know more very nice uh, advances have been coming up in uh, algorithms many of them actually are intuitive um, if you have been following the uh, nlp models um, for example 
BERT, B E R T, um, the um, transformer for NLP recognition, was recently uh, modernized um, and optimized with the architecture called ALBERT, A L, and then same B E R T. Uh, it's just using very intuitive um, mechanisms, and of course, there's a lot of uh, free engineering to, uh, I think, improve the uh, the capacity or the to reduce the, the equivalent model size by almost eight to ten times and so in the sense um, they could they could uh, use the extra ca capacity to increase the accuracy uh, you know again i'm just talking about this uh, why neural nets have been going doing very well um, uh, in contrast right statistical models and information material models typically work uh, much more efficiently but so they have to work hand in hand with neural nets to provide solutions so this is a small slide comparing um, the, the variety of features between neural nets and information retrieval you can see uh, accuracy in neural nets is much higher typically the distortion resilience is very large with neural nets so essentially you know you can neural nets can preserve the um, the uh, features, even with the significant variations or changes, uh, you know, so you, so they essentially beat any human engineered um, solutions. But uh, when you go to the search side, the cost of uh, finding number of items uh, becomes um, um, becomes uh, very very large. Um, with um, neural nets so essentially for the search problem for large scale you essentially you have to go to information retrieval okay so i have a poll here now uh, essentially this is about uh, you know uh, what's your awareness level of information retrieval and neural nets Oh, I should have switched this. I should have called this uh, into are you aware of either? Uh, should <laughs> I should have switched this poll. Uh, I believe most of the audience here will know uh, most of this, both both of these, I believe. Okay, very good. Uh, okay. So some are not responding, but uh, I know most of the people here on the uh audience list knows about these so anyway so i'll close the poll here uh another five seconds to go audience please respond whoever is not responded so thank you for the response and here is the result okay yes okay yeah you're right most of the folks were familiar with it. Yeah. So go ahead. So it's good. So I'm happy that uh, people are very informed about uh, both information retrieval and neural nets. Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're very good um, concepts to know. A um, lot of advances. I think um, I just gave an example of uh, how to use information retrieval. Uh, basically, you generate a vector to describe any object, image, or document. Even uh, even um, your uh, documents, text can be converted into a vector, right? So that's what um, all the embedded vectors are doing uh, at one level. And so uh, from the vector, they are able to transform this into uh, even translate it into different languages uh, to, or, you know, use sequence to sequence uh, modeling in, uh, uh, with NLP. But for the information retrieval problem, again, similarly, you need that vector to describe something and use the this vector to search in your uh, data set uh, and to find um, the closest item or nearest neighbor. And this typically used for many applications, including recommendations.
Um, yeah, so this slide is coming from um, Facebook. Facebook has, again, this is one of their open source uh, advances uh, they have made. They have called Detectron 2. So they had Detectron uh, by itself first, and now they have called Detectron 2, uh, which has uh, advanced, uh, uh, advanced uh, you know, object detection. And uh, they were, I think they had also pioneered, uh, put a lot of effort to make PyTorch uh, what it is. And PyTorch is actually a dominant um, machine learning platform um, today. And um, so the efforts from Facebook have really um, done well. Uh, you know, the detector on here for, for uh, videos and images, they have the, um, wave to letter for speech recognition um, yeah and they have a variety of projects so it's pretty good work from their side uh, i will not describe this too much uh, i will not describe this uh, yes you are aware and there are probably you have many uh, presentations um, that highlight this workflow right taking an image um, and detecting the objects at the end Uh, another key aspect of all these processing is text recognition. Right? Text recognition is very important. Um, uh, whenever you go to urban places or if you are watching shows or you are watching educational content, um, there's a lot of con uh, text inside of it. So text recognition is a very critical feature. Um, it's um, it also gives you context. Um, there have been many advances. Uh, recently, there is a library called Craft, which performs uh, actually significantly better, maybe even better than the cloud APIs. Cloud Google Vision was considered uh, among the best, even Microsoft Vision, but um, they would have some, uh, some gaps. Typically, when the images had a different kind of a background, um, and uh, so th this seems to craft seems to perform quite well. Um, so uh, yeah, what? Uh, so, uh, just a little discussion about how you can do better than you know what Google Vision or any of these uh, OCR libraries, text recognition libraries offer you. So often the text that you receive will have errors. It will have uh, spelling mistakes. Uh, so these are, have to be resolved through multiple techniques. Uh, first of all, I think you have to take the geometry in, um, into mind. The geometry of all these texts that is recognized is uh, often ignored, but it's a very critical thing. So in the sense, if there is a gap between two letters, right, you want to be able to understand it, that they have that the text recognition software has missed some letter. Or if the, uh, if the gap is too small and, you know, the test recognition software could have made a split a letter into two. So uh, knowing the geometry matters, uh, knowing the details about the confidence in the detection matters because you know something uh, could be falsely detected and could have lower confidence. So these are very critical uh, aspects and you could resolve them through a variety of NLP processes, um, uh, including spe iterative spelling checks, you could do, uh, you know, what are the entities? Uh, so let's say you cannot, if you depend on standard NLP entity detection, you would be in the 90% range, uh, maybe even lower, right? But if you want to really be close to the top, uh, near 100%, you would have to do something, uh, some string matching, some innovative uh, measure to fix this, including spelling checks. Um, so the reason, uh, yeah, so again, this is um, just a summary on test recognition. Um, Craft is the one which has advanced further. Uh, it uses character boxes, affinity, um, that is similar, uh, affinity, similarity between the letters, you know. So it is using more intuitive uh, measures to actually provide better accuracy. It can even detect out of ver vocabulary words. Uh, which means uh, they were not uh, trained in the model. 
So that's pretty um, significant advancements. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to have a poll about machine learning innovations. Um, you know, what kind of innovations uh, you are familiar with? Uh, this question can, you know, I was uh, concerned that it might not be uh, might not be worded appropriately, but still, uh, I just want to get a feel of uh, where people are. I think uh, most of them will know the first two definitely. Some would have heard of the last one as well. Mm -hmm. Audience. Rest of you, please, uh, as well, respond. Another five seconds, please, all of you, respond. People are tired of for the day, I believe. <laughs> so we'll close it here. <laughs> close it here. Um, oh, so uh, oh, you did get a response, okay. Yeah. Oh, it was the opposite, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Closing it now. Okay. So uh, yeah, I think linear had zero. So linear is basically um, you know getting a continuous number at the output, right? So um, uh, it, it could be predicting um, uh, you know sales of some item, or you know it's, it's a more continuous uh, thing um, value uh, rather than a, a group of classes. Um, I think uh, people uh, said recommendations, quite a few. And our reinforcement learning, people had the highest uh, numbers, right? So, yeah. right, I think so. If you also saw the um, uh, the, the comment by um, uh, Jan Lacun, right? He said reinforcement learning is like the cherry, right? And uh, the main, um, Main use cases are unsupervised learnings. So I'll give an example of unsupervised learnings, which is said was like a community or a group. So being automatically being able to classify some input into a group, say for example, the simplest one is an anomaly. Anomaly, uh, is this um, typical behavior or it is something uh, wrong with the system? Right, is a delivery, uh, let's say, um, a delivery system that is working, like, you know, Swiggy or any of these DoorDash or people that deliver food or items, service. Uh, if some process or some, um, some of their service, uh, uh, some of the delivery people or some of their vans or some of the areas have some issue, uh, the anomaly detection will highlight it quickly. So this this is typically separated out, could be separated out by just um, a large scale unsupervised learning. Right. Uh, of course, some uh, some um, level of combinations are used to improve the accuracies, um, but essentially a bulk of it can be done in unsupervised method. Um, same way the um, um, the auto encoders are, you know, similar in the sense they take a large set of inputs and compress them to a small set of data. So um, essentially, um, it is trained by itself because um, um, it, it is just minimizing the error. Um, there are sequence to sequence applications, which I would say uh, typical in all the um, NLP use cases. Uh, translations, 
um, to summarization, uh, these are typical sequence to sequence modeling issues. Um, and okay, so there were some of the machine learning innovation that we just wanted to talk here briefly. How do you really advance, uh, make advancement in machine learning, right? Um, you need to collect good data sets that represent the problem. You need to be able to train a solution. Uh, you should be able to perform transfer learning. Uh, often, um, you know, you might not have such a big data set. And there are big companies and the people who have come before us who have done, collected lots of data. So you essentially want to take something that has been trained and, um, and then do fine tuning on top of it. So transfer learning is a very important feature. For training, data augmentation does become a very useful key because um, often your data sets or uh, to generate data and to label data. So if you're going to collect some data, you need to label it and labeling becomes very expensive, very fast and slows you down. So data augmentation is something that you can generate to yourself. Uh, it's uh, also, you could call it synthetic um, sets. So if you can generate synthetic sets, you know what the uh, label is. So it's, it's a very key, big key into um, training better models. And uh, a big feature that is going is happening is uh, edge inference, being able to um, infer on the edge of smaller devices. Um, and as well, the other thing is being able to cascade features and nets, you know, be able to do something like we talked about, audio features, video features, being able to combine these things together and the edge. Uh, I think, okay, so um, yeah, so this is uh, like uh, where we are at, at our company. So we are uh, the, the we, uh, at the top left, we have these colors deliver AI services. Uh, you know, the darker ones is where we have done work already and the, the um, Grade ones is somewhere and significant work needs to be done. Uh, it's the same slide of uh, you know all the four different modules with data at the center to deliver um, applications. To you know deliver uh, AI applications from video understanding. Um, but this is like the the picture that I have. My I think uh, the rest is acronyms and there are some references at the end. Um, I try to put all the interesting references uh, from the universities, from the top, um, uh, top researchers. Uh, Professor Malik, uh, Jitendra Malik, I hope I had his quote here. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't uh, have a quote from him here and he's one of the most foremost researchers in this space uh, from Berkeley. Uh, he did uh, have very good uh, comments about uh, the future of computer vision. Um, there are many others, uh, Toralba and Felsensberg. Yeah, I got his. Um, it's it's uh, very interesting that most of these researchers have uh, some intuitive ideas and they typically Kind of continue on the same line, just with more advancements. Uh, you know, it's uh, very interesting. The next slide is um, more about the cloud services. Uh, you know, variety of pipelines. Um, you know that people are offering. Um, and the the la last slide is essentially uh, more on the application side. You know, um, application as well as some of the information retrieval algorithms. Uh, scan is that uh, most uh, recent improvement in the uh, high dimensional feature vector search. Um, the uh, other ones is uh, lots of detail it's from LinkedIn KDD. You know, slate based recommendations is uh, the in thing for delivering online um, recommendations. 
uh, which is interacting. So, so that's one thing I didn't mention about reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is typically used for the interactive component, smaller models, uh, but interactive and uh, online. Um, most of the heavy duty models uh, which are done offline are built outside. Uh, they are not online and they are they are the bulk of the system, but they are typically run in the high data processing elements. Um, I have a, a reference on NLP and knowledge graphs. Modern data infrastructures is a, a very good reference. Um, and another um, application is just a vendor example, uh, you know, how the vendor provides a solution. That's a rock set. Okay, so I think I'm done with this. Uh, yep, and then, um, yeah, so thank you. Um, I'm happy to have this talk uh, about how uh, AI products are enabled through uh, all these um, infrastructures, uh, AI models, data platforms. Um, Great. Thank you, uh, Joe. Yep. So uh, people are saying thanks for the great presentation, great insights. Any questions, audience? I think it was pretty clear. Uh, Somebody is saying uh, uh, since you have uh, you contributed to so many patents, uh, would love to hear some technical sessions as well from you. Yep. So, although our uh, uh, calendars are packed, but I would suggest if we can do that uh, sometime in November uh, morning hours, if, if audience prefer, or at the same time in evening uh, someday, uh, or, or December will also do. Um, so and, yeah, so just a Q and A. Yeah, go ahead. And another one is, uh, could you speak something about difference between ML ops for edge versus ML ops for cloud? ML ops or what did you say? Yeah, machine learning operations. Ops, uh, yeah, for edge versus cloud. Oh, that's uh, okay. That's a tough one. Okay, uh, because ML ops is a different field, right? It's basically uh, running operations. So uh, I haven't really uh, dug deeper into ML ops on the edge versus cloud. Um, I had looked at it as a, you know, as one entity. Uh, you know, because uh, we run this on the um, systems mostly, looking at the cloud uh, but i guess uh, the edge is uh, input always right so edge in the sense if it is a if it is a delivery mechanism the uh, the edge is all the vehicles all the delivery people you know uh, all the lo lo locations you know they, there could be a traffic uh, accident somewhere there could be a rally you know so yeah so the, that could be the edge um, i guess i looked at it as a combined system um, because uh, um, essentially ml ops would need to look at both so you could call the edge as something that is uh, not the servers or the applications that are going wrong but the the end devices that are going wrong right so i think typically yeah, and ML ops is a very big field. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one is one basic clarification: Could information retrieval be used for video analytics, like mask detection and video feed as well? Uh, what do you mean, the mask? COVID mask or what? <laughs> uh ma'am can you please uh, yes yeah that's yeah so i guess yeah. people have done this already right so mass detection so this is more of a matter of classification i guess because there's only one case right yes or no um or you know or or 
based on the criteria there could be a few variations because there might be different types of masks so i guess uh, it would be a few classes um, that is um, whether there is a mask or not so i would say this is more a neural net approach rather than a information retrieval because uh, you know neural nets would be robust to variations and you could make get a better solution to that okay another one is uh, this is just an example could could video analytics be using uh, ir uh, yes i think we have used uh, often for this uh, information retrieval because to recognize large video collections um, to large sets of images uh, it has been done same way like uh, i gave you an example of uh, facebook fs right which is a face detector a billion faces so yeah i guess um, typical media content uh, recognizing large number of uh, even objects and uh, does information retrieval does play a role uh, but to handle things that are you know distorted or changing um, to verify at a more uh, smaller level um, you know neural net has a very big approach uh, neural net also is very critical to generate the features that go into information retrieval okay thanks a lot so any any other final questions i we can take one more although we have already short up the time last one question if anybody would like to ask so i don't think anybody else is asking so thanks a lot uh, joe for sparing time for this session and look forward to more such uh, and more technical sessions in future uh, i would like to inform you that we have very very highly technical audience uh, most of the time so best yeah. would be if you can give very very tech, tech oriented uh, webinars i think you will get very good uh, feedback on that as well so All thanks right. a lot for uh, for your session today it was uh, some slides were really quite new to me as you were showing the uh, video mixer one so great uh, and thank you audience for joining some of you are also from across the world so joe is from us we have somebody from Italy and uh, Australia and Australia is late into the night, uh, but uh, still people are attending. Thank you for joining and uh, I look forward to see you in more such sessions. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Great ahead and uh, good night to all the uh, rest of the world. Thank you. Good night, people. Bye.